Today we'll be releasing the Agency of Natural Resource Report on the Health of Vermont's Environment. Um, it, this is a long time in the making. It's actually uh, part of um, a tradition that we're going back to between 1993 and 2004, ANR produced a yearly State of the Environment Report and, uh, and then left off doing it. And in light of the incredible year we've experienced, and the incredible stresses we've seen on our natural environment, we decided to reinstitute this uh, tradition. Um, going into the future, we're probably not going to be producing a fancy report like this every year. We're going to uh, have the report online and update the indicators, though, year to year, so we could track progress over time. Um, in the leadership team, we've been thinking that maybe a report of this magnitude once every five years, because year to year, there's obviously not the degree of change that would warrant a full report. Um, it's not easy to do a report like this, and so I'd like to begin by thanking the many KNR staff, some of who are here with us today, who helped gather data, write, proofread. Um, it was a lot of work. It was organized by, uh, by Sarah McKiernan, who's here. She did the lion's share of the writing, and she's actually uh, in the back here. Uh, thank you for your great work, Sarah. And then um, we also ended up uh, working with uh, Linda Mirabel from from Ravenmark and her partner, uh, Rebecca Davidson, who did a, just a gorgeous job designing the report. It's actually not easy to, um, to design uh, a, a report that has so much data in it that, you, that we, our goal is to make it accessible to the average reader. So I want to thank them especially for their hard work. So what did we learn from this report? Um, one thing you can see when you read through the report, is uh, that in nature, as in life, everything is connected. In light of the devastating storms that we saw last year, um, the theme of the report is resilience. And right at the beginning, we define what we think of as resilience. Resilience is the ability to adapt to difficult situations and successfully overcome adversity. And research shows that that uh, just like individuals and communities, our ecosystems will recover from adversity best when they have social supports or a, a network of support, in this case, environmental supports for communities and individuals and social supports. Um, for this reason, this report, this year's report, provides an assessment of where we are today, uh, looking at it through the lens of resilience. It uh, identifies the biggest threats to Vermont's environmental health and asks important questions about what we need to do to make sure Vermont is more resilient into the future. Now, it doesn't cover everything. We've got a big agency. There's a lot of issues that it leaves for another day. But we picked out what we saw as the most important uh, issues. So here's a little of what we found. First of all, climate change. During the past 50 years, Vermont's climate has shown a clear warming trend in all seasons, and especially in winter. New climate patterns stress our ecosystems. For example, uh, it, it results in it, it increases in rainfall and extreme uh, weather events, uh, which result in the kinds of floods we saw last year. So to become more resilient to climate change, we need to look at things like how do we manage our floodplains to make room for, uh, for, for our river so that we'll be more resilient next time there are extreme weather events. Um, we're also using ANR's emissions inventory to set goals for reducing Vermont's greenhouse gas emissions and to track our progress. So we need to look at adaptation, climate ad adaptation. Flood resilience is certainly one piece of it. Um, and we also need to be on track to be part of the solution. Water quality. One thing that we learned from this report that was really remarkable is that the, the health of our lakes is inextricably bound and inextricably linked to the health and sustainability of our rivers and streams. Lake Champlain's water quality suffered in 2011 because of the heavy rains that fell both in the spring and then in, in uh, late summer with Irene. And we saw tremendous algae blooms over the course of the summer. You probably all remember that. And that was because there was a, a lot of phosphorus that came down our rivers and streams uh, into the lake. Um, we, we really now can demonstrate that the scattering of those streams, bringing that phosphorus in, was a major contributor, competing with, uh, with the other uh, sources of phosphorus pollution that we've been focusing on in past years. So that means that our lake and river protection efforts have to be linked. 
increasing the stability of our rivers and streams is essential for preventing uh, and reducing water pollution in our lakes. Forest health. It's really hard to overstate the importance and value of Vermont's forests to the health of our environment, not to mention our economy and way of life. And this past year, our forests helped to intersect a lot of heavy rainfalls. We would have had even worse flooding had we uh, had less forest in place. Uh, trees, of course, also remove greenhouse gas, car carbon dioxide from the air, which is a, and, and then they store it in their leaves and, and wood and roots. And so it's a, an important part of our climate change agenda, making sure that we're not losing our forest lands. Um, and of course, our forests are at risk. Uh, there, it's risk, you know, the risk is from development, from fragmentation, uh, and it's also, they're also at risk because of invasives, because of our changing climate, there, there are pests that now, uh, now are challenging some of our, uh, our forests uh, and forest health, and of course, the spread of invasive species is really pretty significant. You can look through, there's 10 different topics in, in this report that we cover, uh, all with some interesting data. Uh, but I have to end on a real positive note, because one another thing we learned from uh, putting together this report is that we have many assets in Vermont for build, building resilience. Uh, Vermonters understand not only this idea that everything's connected, but that they also have to be part of the solution, and that our environment is so closely tied to our quality of life, our identities as a community, the vigor of our economy, and our health. Vermonters understand that, so that allows us um, to work together to protect this important asset. We also, you'll see in this report, we have a wealth of scientific information and data. In fact, a lot of what we do at the Agency of Natural Resources is we collect data, we, we do research, um, so that when we make decisions, it's based on sound science. These are complex environmental problems, and we really have the brain power to, uh, to attack them. So I've got great hope for our future, and during Earth Week, um, I want to ask our, my, uh, during Earth Week, I want to ask my fellow Vermonters to join us in our effort to making Vermont resilient and sustainable into the future. Thank you. And I've got uh, Commissioner David Mears up next. Thank you, Secretary Markowitz. I think the, the point that I want to flesh out a little bit more is the linkage between the environment and the economy of shared prosperity in Vermont. One of the things that has been a joy to me in coming to Vermont is being able to work with the community folks who get it, that they get that not only is there no tension between environmental quality and economic prosperity, but the two things are so inextricably linked in this state. And this report reflects some of the ways in which that is true. One of the things we've learned as we've looked at this issue of flood resilience is the fact that the iconic Vermont landscape, this beautiful landscape we have of working and wild forests, of farms, of fields and meadows, of rivers, all punctuated by compact communities and small downtowns, is actually critical to reducing future flood damage. And the more that we work to build and reinforce that landscape in the state, the more we will be also contributing to future reductions in the um, cost of flood damage in the future. Similarly, as we do a better job of reducing and removing waste out of the waste stream and using more recycling, composting more of our waste, we're saving energy, we are uh, reducing the impacts, the aesthetic light on our landscapes of caused by landfills, we are contributing to the economic well-being of this state. There's issue after issue as you go through the, the science and the information in this report that tells that same story repeatedly. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Patrick Berry. Thank you. Um, in, in the same way that uh, this report is truly a product of all three departments within the agency, uh, a lot of hard work by, by folks that were here, even some that weren't. Um, the issues of resiliency that were previously mentioned uh, by the Secretary and Commissioner Mears um, are, you, you can't separate them from the work of those three departments, whether it is uh, river corridor management, wildlife habitat, forest resources, they are all intertwined. Um, 
And one thing that we're going to continue to focus on is as we look at the, the status of our environment right now and uh, as we plan for the future, is, is how to uh, ensure our ability to be adaptive and resilient in the, in, in the future. And um, our efforts to look at forest resources, wildlife habitat together, um, to protect important travel corridors, to maintain genetic diversity, to protect large unfragmented areas of habitat, um, to focus our efforts on um, changing species assemblage, change to our forest, to make sure that uh, we're well equipped in the future to protect these resources. Is, is something that's integral throughout the report and something that's integral to the work that, that we continue to do. So I would just uh, conclude by saying that um, I think you'll find that the report um, shows that interconnectedness, um, takes a snapshot of time, and, and if you take a close look at the work that we're doing on resiliency and adaptation, specifically with regard to climate change, uh, we're planning well into the future as well. Thanks. If uh, you have any questions, we're happy to take some questions. So the last major report like this was 2004? That's right. And um, what trends have you identified in, over that period from then to now? I guess that's eight years. Uh, what's, what's getting better about Vermont's environment over that time and what's getting worse? Well, um, this report actually doesn't do sort of a long-term comparison in that way. Like we, we have, we didn't, what we did is we didn't, we didn't take the 2004 and that you know, whatever was in that last 2004 report, see where it went. But that being said, we do see trends. Um, we, across Vermont, um, we continue to have development. That's not surprising. Um, and there is, uh, there are, we continue to uh, fragment our farms, right? We divide up big parcels, and that's actually happening at a fairly alarming rate. And for those of us who care about um, wildlife, connectivity, habitat connectivity, and, and um, that's something of concern that we're watching. In the air uh, arena, um, we see continued and increasing problems from mercury, mercury pollution, mostly coming from Midwest coal plants. Um, at the same time, there's some hopeful information about uh, the, the uh, pollutants that cause acid rain. Now, that being said, the lakes in our, our high elevation areas um, aren't recovering yet from the acid rain they've experienced over the decades. But we do see that some of the national controls that, uh, that were meant to, uh, to minimize some of those pollutants uh, are having an effect. In, um, there's a, a one area, uh, a, a wildlife area, where they test for uh, visibility, and, and we've seen really marked improvements. Um, solid waste. You know, we've got this bill that we're hoping is going to pass the Senate that's going to put in place mandatory recycling. One of the things that we saw really stagnate over this time was our rates of recycling. Uh, and what's uh, a little bit alarming about it is our increase, that we've seen an increase in, in the amount of trash that individuals generate, but, but the uh, amount of recycling has really stayed the same in terms of the, the rate of personal recycling. So, uh, so that actually supports the move of the legislature to put in uh, a bill that, uh, that creates equal opportunity, essentially, for recycling as in trash disposal. So there are some examples. If you look through the report there, there you'll, you'll be able to find some others as well. One, one important trend just, uh, that, that relates to the, the solid waste piece is there was some, um, as you know, last year there was a new electronic waste program put into place. And we saw some fairly dramatic increases in the levels of electronic waste recycling. It demonstrated to us that when you make recycling convenient and easy for people, they will do it. Um, in Vermont, people are very willing to recycle things like electronic waste, which would otherwise be causing serious problems in our landfills. So that's a, that was a hopeful trend, and I think marks something that we're going to take some lessons from as we develop future solid waste policy. Other questions? Uh, one of the big environmental initiatives over, the last, over that same period of time, we were, we were just, um, since the last report, really, has been the effort to clean up Lake Champlain. How's that coming? Well, um, one thing you have to remember when we, when we think about cleaning up Lake Champlain is that uh, the problem, the phosphorus problem in Lake Champlain, uh, is a generational problem. It took, a, it took generations to create that problem. It's going to take, uh, it's going to take time to, uh, to address that problem. 
Um, we have seen improvements, um, not as much as we'd like, and of course, um, after Irene and the, the Lake Champlain record flooding of last year, we had the highest phosphorus loads ever, and, uh, and that's a problem. The, the hopeful information, though, that you see in this report is um, a study was done, supported by the International Joint Commission, that took a look at um, one area of, of the watershed, one watershed that uh, ends up in Lake Champlain, and um, was able to identify uh, places that, uh, that, uh, pro that provided a disproportionate amount of the phosphorus pollution. So it allowed us to, to identify critical source areas that if we focus our resources on these spots, we'll, we'll make a, a, a magnified impact in, uh, in addressing the problem. So, um, our, we've gotten a lot of tools, we've been developing tools over the past eight years. There's been a significant investment thanks to our senator, Senator Leahy, bringing money in to the Lake Champlain Basin Program. So with that money, we've been doing a lot of research so that we can better target our efforts to clean up the lake. It is, uh, it's, a, it's a complex problem, and as I said earlier in this report, we also discovered the, the role that, um, that proper stream and river management plays in, uh, in reducing phosphorus loading in the lake. I, the one thing I would add, this is, this is a little bit down in the weeds, but there was a study that done some analysis of existing water quality data and tributaries in the Lake Champlain, um, done in collaboration with the USGS, the US Geological Survey, and what we saw is that phosphorus levels go up when flows go up, and that doesn't necessarily tell you that and flows range so much from year to year. You can't necessarily tell whether you're having a good impact or if you're reducing the concentrations of phosphorus <coughs> from year to year easily. But USGS, using very sophisticated mathematical modeling, was able to determine that in some watersheds, we actually are seeing reduced concentrations once you kind of take out the noise and the data associated with the flows. So I don't mean to suggest by that that you know, we've checked the box and can move on. But it does give us some helpful and useful information to start to get down in more detail about where actions we're taking on the landscape are working. And there are places where it shows some progress. Any other questions? Did oh, you, yes. Got if you have questions, that's fine, actually. Uh, OK. Um, you mentioned uh, development continuing in Vermont a moment ago. Uh, and yet, um, the economy has been for the past few years now, and the housing starts have been way down, and so on. Is that does that take some of the pressure off? Is that uh, is that a does any silver line, silver lining through the economic concerns that helps well, the development? Not really. In Vermont, we, we because of our uh, strong um, uh, land use planning <coughs> laws, you know, Act 250 and the local zoning, um, we we end up not having the kind of speculative development they that they've had in other states. And, uh, and that's actually been a great thing for our economy because, you know, compared to the rest of the nation, we have the lowest number of foreclosures. Uh, but when the economy is slow, we have less, you know, less building and rebuilding. Um, I think one of the big threats to Vermont is will continue to be uh, development and how uh, we develop. And, and of course, we're, we're working closely with, uh, with ACCD to, to, uh, to really focus um, our priorities on smart growth policies to try to get uh, development to not equal parcelization or sprawl, but to do it in a way that will make us more resilient into the future. Well, one trend, though, that uh, yeah. yeah, one trend though, which may not have anything to do with whether or not the economy is up or down, is that um, if you look at our historic village settlement patterns where there are smaller lots of houses. Over time, there is a trend where more land is fragmented and taken up by an individual development unit. So there's increasing lot sizes, which increases fragmentation over time. That is a trend that's a problem, which has nothing to do with whether the economy is, is, is up or down. It's something that I think we really need to focus our attention on. Anything else? Okay, thank you very much. Great, I think, uh, Ash, one closing One, one closing thing, which, which you may have regret saying, but I think uh, as we launch this report, as we celebrate uh, Earth Day and Earth Week, it's also the 75th anniversary of the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Act, which has pumped 
12 billion dollars into wildlife, fish and wildlife conservation. Um, and I know the Secretary feels very strongly about that. We want to encourage folks to get out and enjoy the resources. We're third in the nation in wildlife-based recreational activities. Vermonters know quality of life when they see it, and that's why they live here. And when Vermonters are connected to the resource, they feel more passionate about conserving them. And whether it's uh, you know enjoying one of the state parks or a hike in wildlife management area, uh, enjoying the return of some of the migratory birds, it's trout season open, walleye season is opening soon, spring turkey hunting season is opening soon. Get out there and enjoy what this report is really addressing. So just in closing, I want to say that um, one thing, the reason why this report is so important is one of the things that we all know at the Agency of Natural Resources is that we cannot accomplish our mission alone, our mission to protect, to preserve, enhance Vermont's environment for this and future generations. We're only going to accomplish that goal if we engage all Vermonters, and we can only do that if we give folks good information to work with. And so this Earth Day, we're hoping that our report will become a catalyst for action across the state. So thank you very much, and thank you to the staff at ANR and to uh, Linda and Sarah for all your great work.